So let us understand a few other business problems and let us get comfortable with respect to devising the business problem and documenting that. When you interact with the customer, customer might not always give you, you know, business problem in a very structured manner. They might speak their mind out. They might tell you what their problems are, but it is up to the data scientist to decipher what the customer is trying to say, and you'll have to document it in a nice structured manner. Alongside that, you also need to record the objectives and constraints. And uh, whatever we have discussed, everything would also be made available to you all in terms of mind map. So if I were to just go to 360digitmg.com and click on mind map, you'll have a drop down. Please select Certificate Program in Data Science. Click on that. The moment you double click, the branch expands, branch of the mind map expands. And when you double click, it collapses. You can also zoom in, zoom out, and then explore further. So the project management methodology that we started talking about is CRISP MLQ. Cross industry standard process for machine learning with quality assurance. And this has overall six phases. Out of these six phases, the first phase is what we are talking about. And within the first phase, you have two sub phases. One is understanding the business, another is data understanding. So business understanding and you have data understanding. As part of <clears throat> business understanding, you are expected to record the business objectives and business constraints. You might have a single business objective or you might have multiple business objectives. At the same time, you might have a single constraint or you might have multiple constraints. And when you record the business objectives and business constraints, we need to ensure that we document those using two to three words. But if you feel that, do you know what? Two to three words you know, is very short for me to document the objectives or constraints, then you can expand to four to five words, but certainly not more than a sentence. It should not be a paragraph, right? In a crisp manner, it has to send out a clear message saying that this is the objective that you're trying to achieve given the constraints. And you also need to document the success criteria. Please always remember one thing, friends. I understand that we are going to eventually become data scientists. However, using data science concepts, we are trying to solve a specific business problem. Hence, we need to record the business success criteria. What is that you're going to achieve for, from the business standpoint? After that comes your machine learning success criteria. What are the algorithms that you're going to you know, use? And what is the accuracy that you're going to achieve? It's not just accuracy. You also can think about performance. How fast would your algorithm give the prediction results? For example, if you're working in the space of stock market and say you're trying to forecast on what will be the stock value for the next month, or not next month, rather, I should say, for the next second, what will be the stock value for the next second? In that case, your performance would be probably one second or half a second. 
or probably within milliseconds, you need to forecast or predict on what will be the stock value so that you can take required actions automatically, of course. All these actions that are taken are in the stock market, especially are using robotic trading algorithms. Anyways, that's some additional info for you guys. And finally, you have economic success criteria. When it comes to economic success criteria, you always talk about cost. What is the benefit? I'm going to pay you because you are a bunch of data scientists, so I'll pay you money and I'll ask you to solve the business problem. And when you solve the business problem, I'm going to pay you. Say I pay you a million dollars as part of your consulting engagement. So I need to get at least, you know, a million dollars in return. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense for me to start the project, right? I'm talking from senior management standpoint. Okay. Another very important thing that you all have to remember is that whenever you record your objectives or constraints, please try, try to use the terms such as minimize or maximize. Try to use the terms such as minimize or maximize. These terms are called as data optimization terms. You're trying to either minimize something or maximize something. Maybe you want to minimize the customer dissatisfaction. Maybe you want to minimize the employee attrition rate, resignation. Maybe you want to minimize the customer churn. Customers who might be using ATEL connection might switch to Geo. Customers who are using AT&T mobile connection might switch to Verizon. Customers who are using uh, probably Cellcom might switch to TN from Malaysian context, US context and Indian context. I just quoted a few examples. Okay. <clears throat> so always try to start your objectives and constraints using the terms such as minimize or maximize. While this is not mandatory, it is extremely recommended. Okay. And You'll also learn about project charter when you actually start working on your life project. But let me tell you that project charter is the first document that gets created on any project. It may not be data science project. It can be any other project. However, project charter is the first document that gets created on any project whatsoever. Okay, and this contains high level information. It contains at a high level, what is it that the customer would be expecting in the product that we are going to build or on the project that we are trying to accomplish? What are the high level requirements of the customer? What are the milestones? Probably you can say that the moment I complete data collection, I would call it as milestone one. After I build the model, I'm going to call it as milestone two. Once I deploy the model in production for people to use the machine learning algorithm, I would call it as milestone three. Okay. In that way, you create logical milestones. Not a detailed plan. This would be at a very high level. Okay. Budget. For each milestone, how much would be the money? How would you charge to the customer? Would it be weekly or would it be monthly or would it be based on milestones? The moment you complete milestones, would you be getting the money? Yes. Those are the kind of things that would get documented in the project charter. Who are the key stakeholders on the project? The important folks, decision makers, their details would be available here and the high level risks. What are the risks that we foresee at a high level? Because if this project is destined to fail, let it fail early. That's rational. And then this specific document called as project charter 
would be signed by the project sponsor. Project sponsor is the person who would be promising to give you the required software, give you the required hardware, and give you the required human resources. He would approve, formally say that, yes, I would be the person who would supply you with the required resources. It could be human resources, it could be non-human resources. Once your project charter is in place, that would be the key output of this business understanding piece. Once you're done with that, then we proceed further to the next phase, which is data understanding. So let's complete a few of the other business problems understanding, objectives and constraints, then we would certainly come back to this. And very, very frequently, I am going to refer to the mind map because you know it kind of gives you that visual feel and it would be making your life easier in terms of remembering the things as opposed to running through the slides, PowerPoint presentations, yeah. Okay, back to our discussion here. So business problem, the next business problem is related to e-commerce. Probably one of the e-commerce companies could be Amazon, okay? Could be Netflix. Netflix sells movies, thinking think from that uh, standpoint. Of course, you have subscription models, but still. Amazon, Flipkart, so on and so forth. What if e-commerce head walks up to you and says that, you know what? The present recommendation system is not effective. What is a recommendation system? If you go and search for a product on maybe Amazon or Flipkart or any of the e-commerce portals, if you go and search for a product, a few other products would get recommended. It says that, hey, people who have purchased this have also purchased these. If you search for, for instance, iPhone, the most probable recommendations would be the screen guard, tampered glass, and the face plate, that is the phone cover, so on and so forth, right? These would be the most obvious recommendations. If the e-commerce head says that, do you know what? We have a recommendation system in place, but that is not effective. For this problem, you need to come up with the objective, business objective. And maybe you might want to sell that, okay, as part of recommendation system, you either cross-sell or upsell. What do I mean by that? Say, for example, you're trying to search for iPhone. And within the recommendation, Okay, you might see probably um, iMac. You might see probably MacBook. You might see iPad, right? So, so on and so forth. So what is happening? You're trying to cross sell. While a customer is trying to search for iPhone, you're trying to cross sell a few other products. That is called as cross-selling. But say you're trying to search for iPhone 12, and then if iPhone 13, and maybe iPhone 13 Pro, if these get recommended, that means you're trying to upsell the same product. You're trying to sell a higher configuration of that. That would be called as upselling. Cross-selling is this. You Try, try to cross sell the other products. Okay. So when you try to recommend products, your goal would be to either cross sell something or upsell something. This is what we usually focus upon. So maybe you might want to document your objective and say that, 
I wish to maximize the cross-selling and upselling. There are multiple ways of doing this, friends. You can probably say that, you know, I am going to send the customer a lot of emails with discount coupons. I'm going to send a lot of emails on the product recommendations. If you keep doing that, if you keep bombarding your customers with a lot of emails, customers, customers might get bogged down. They might say, hey, let me unsubscribe to it. Or, you know, this company keeps sending a lot of coupons. I know for a fact that always there'll be some discount. So they lose the value in the coupons that you share. And it might also result in coupon fatigue, meaning the moment you look at that email, you'll be like, oh my God, like what Domino's does usually, right? No matter what, they give you some coupons. In each and every order that you place, Domino's Pizza, they send you a lot of coupons, right? So it's going to cause a lot of coupon fatigue, tiredness, by, by looking at the same coupons time and again, right? So maybe you want to minimize the coupon fatigue and this would turn out to be a business constraint. Always remember friends, whenever you document your business objectives or objectives, you always have to think through on what might be the business constraints. For that one easy go would be, try to think about common sense driven solution to address your objective, to meet your objectives, what is a common sense driven approach is what you can think. The moment you think about common sense driven solutions, uh, you can figure out a lot of challenges associated with that. A lot of issues. Those would ultimately turn out to become your business constraints. Obviously, you know, only if a specific business problem is challenging enough, people will actually value that solution. Okay, let's look at yet another example here. Google AdWords is not effective. You know what? This is the era of digital transformation. This is the era of digital marketing. And a lot of companies are pumping money left, right, and center because they want to be recognized on the online forum, in the digital forum. And what if one of the company heads walks up to you and says that, hey, we are pumping in money left, right, and center into Google AdWords. However, we feel that Google AdWords strategy is not effective. We're not getting the required benefits. Usually what happens when you search for something on Google, ads will start appearing and it will be written in small that that's an ad. And when the ad appears, it is called as an impression. Okay, it is called as impression, meaning the ad appeared for a specific customer. But then Google won't charge you for the impressions. They won't charge you for that, but they will charge you when a customer clicks on the ad. So if a customer clicks on this ad, they would most probably come onto your website. They will land on your website, right? Each time they click, Google is going to charge you. If, if you are a company who is doing Google AdWords, Google is going to charge you. So that's called as click through rate. How many times am I showing the ad and how many customers are clicking on that? Only if this ad is relevant, people would click. And if more number of customers click and land on your website, they might register or they might purchase the product. But here, Google AdWords strategy is not effective. So maybe you'll say that, okay, so let me say that the business objective function here is to maximize the click-through rate. So you are now starting to focus on 
increasing the number of customers who click. If I were to increase that, a common sense driven strategy would be, let me put more money into Google AdWords so that that appears for more customers so that more people click on that. If you keep doing that, you'll be losing a lot of money. A lot of money would go down the drain. That's not an effective strategy. Effective strategy is with the minimum money that I can spend, what is the maximum number of clicks that I can obtain? I wish to spend less money on Google AdWords, but you know, I want more number of people to click on this and come to the website. That means I want to increase the effectiveness of the advertisement. So your business constraint would be minimize the cost per click. Your customers would say that, Do you know what, while you're trying to maximize the click through rate, I also want you to help me minimize the cost per click because each time you click, Google is going to charge you some money. But if your ad is well written, I mean, if the keywords in your ad are perfect, then you know what happens? Google is going to reduce the cost per click because they believe that, okay, this is very effective advertisement. So let me charge less, right? So this is how, once you understand the business problem, you go ahead and document the objectives and constraints. Each time you document the objectives and constraints, please ensure that you use the terms such as minimize or maximize. Point number one. Point number two, please try to keep the objectives and constraints restricted to two to three words. If you cannot do that, probably you can increase to four to five words, but not more than that. This is all common sense, if you ask me. Okay? But it requires a lot of time, a lot of patience. And whenever you are embarking on any business problem, so I mean, embarking on a journey to solve a specific business problem, do research. Try to understand what are the similar kind of business problems which were solved in the past. Okay, what were the business problems which were solved in the past? You try to understand, you try to do some research. If you're working with certain companies, if they already have a data science team, you might want to check the repositories of previously uh, solved business problems. They would have worked on multiple projects, data science projects. You can go check with them on, did they ever solve a similar kind of a business problem? So this is about your business understanding. Once we understand on what is it that we are trying to solve, we'll have to go ahead and collect the appropriate data needed to solve the business problem. So let's proceed further. Okay. So before I go here, again, I'll take you guys back to the mind map and help you all understand this, that once you understand the business, you go and collect the data. Would you collect any data that comes to your mind? Not at all. You are going to collect only the most appropriate data, which is needed to solve your business problem. How do I do that? What might be a good starting point? Okay, you can just say, okay, let me go to Google Scholar. Do you know what? I'm going to now build loan default prediction model. You'll get umpteen number of models. And all these are research articles. A few are paid, a few are free, open source. Go through these, try to understand what kind of data people have used in the past. 
to build the prediction models. What kind of techniques did they apply? What kind of data did they collect? Once you get that information, that would be a good starting point for you to proceed further. Okay, so we are now moving ahead and we are going to understand phase one, part two. Even before we proceed further with data collection, one needs to be aware of what are the various data types. What are the various data types which will give you more information? And what are the kind of data types you need to focus upon? But even before that, we need to understand what are the data types. Right? For that, we are proceeding further with data understanding. Data is a plural form of datum. So, you know, it's basically uh, dat datum is singular. So, henceforth, when I say data, I might use or I might frame the sentence as data are. Uh, don't assume that I don't know English or do not assume, please, that I'm dramatically wrong. Okay. All I mean is, since data is a plural, plural term, I would be saying data R because you'll have a lot of data, data R. Okay, anyways. Data is something which can be measured. Then, what is data actually? It is a measure, something that you can measure. It could be temperature, it could be weight, it could be height, something that you can measure. Why do you need to do that? Because data can be analyzed. It is more factual driven. And why do you need to analyze? Because we need to build models. We need to build prediction models, machine learning models, etc. Why do you need to build models? Because we want to use the models for predicting the future. And why do you want to predict the future? Because I want to be futuristic and I want to be in a position to evaluate the various future possibilities. So it will be used for optimization, which is part of prescriptive analytics. And then the output that comes out of optimization would be used by the management for decision, decision making. Say you built a model, which is a lone default prediction model. Then say you started doing predictions. Or, or let me take a different example, probably because this is something that we have already discussed yesterday. Say you built a model to forecast the sales. So you have built a model to forecast or predict the sales. These two terms are slightly different. Prediction versus forecasting, there's a thin line of difference, but we'll discuss about that later. It's too early to cross the bridge. Say you predicted that sales for the next month might be anywhere between $1 million to $1.2 million. So this is what you have predicted. But then you want to look at various possibilities. For instance, maybe you have 20 sales resources. Maybe you are spending on a daily basis $10,000 on marketing. Maybe you have 10 different products that you're trying to sell. So you might want to now, and probably you're selling these in uh, five different locations, five different countries, or five different cities in a country, etc. right? 
So you want to look at all the permutations, combinations of all of these. And you want to play around with this to understand on what will happen if I increase the salespeople? Would my say overall sales increase? What will happen if I decrease the marketing spend? How would it impact the overall sales? What if I sunset a few of the products, a few of the outdated products, what if I remove those? Or what if I add new products? What if I reduce the locations in which I'm operating? Or what if I increase the number of locations? If I try to play around with all these, um, you know, options which are given, that is called as what if analysis. Okay, so you say evaluated various scenarios using what if analysis by playing around with these. Okay, then what happens is ultimately you will get a combination, right combination, which would help you achieve the maximum sales. So you would be getting the maximum sales because you might be trying to maximize the sales. However, it is subject to all these constraints. It is subject to the restriction or constraint on the number of sales resources, restriction on the amount that you spend on marketing, restriction on the number of products that you have, restriction in the number of locations that you operate in, subject to all these constraints, restrictions are called as constraints, you would try to achieve the maximum sales. So your optimization algorithm would tell you at what point of time would you achieve the maximum sales subject to constraints. And based on the output that you get, your management would take decisions. They would now start taking informed decisions. Okay. All right, now I understand the importance of capturing the data, importance of analyzing, building the model. Oh my God, it's going to help the management a lot. But what data do I need to collect? For that, we need to understand the various data types. Primarily and predominantly, we have two data types. One is called as continuous data and another is called as discrete data. So one is your continuous data and another is discrete data. So let's first understand continuous data. Any data which can be represented using a decimal format would be called as continuous data. For example, if I say, how long would this training module be? You might say, you know what, it'd be for two hours. Or you might say it'd be for two hours and one minute. Or you might say it'd be for two hours, one minute and three seconds. Or you might say it'd be for two hours, one minute, three seconds, and um, you know, 13 milliseconds. In that way, there is no limit in the granularity, in the decimals that you provide. The moment you represent something in decimal format, and if it starts making sense, if it starts making sense, then it's called as continuous data. Even for that case, money. Uh, probably, if you want to purchase, say, Apple uh, MacBook Pro, it might cost you $1,069.30. Okay, if you look at cost of one liter fuel, it might be three ringgits, Malaysian ringgits, three ringgits, uh, you know, 12 cents. So you can represent in decimal format. In Indian rupees, probably cost of one liter fuel would be um, 
99 rupees 32 paise if you can represent something in decimal format and if it starts making sense that would be called as continuous data let us try to draw parallels of that with maybe laptop number of laptops that you have number of laptops you can say you have one laptop or probably you can say you have two laptops or three laptops can you ever say i have 1.62 laptops what do you mean by one two six two laptops are you going to break your laptop into pieces and then keep only 0.62 pieces no either you have one laptop or you have two or three or none so the moment you represent something in decimal format if it does not make sense that's discrete data that means discrete data cannot be represented in decimal format something which cannot be represented in decimal format because it doesn't make sense would be called as discrete data for example number of cars you might say i have one car or you might say you have two cars can you ever say you have 1.39 cars doesn't make sense right so if you represent something in decimal format and if it stops making sense it's discrete data if you represent something in decimal format and if it starts making sense that would be continuous data give a thought what do you think would be height of a person if i if you were to measure the height of a person do you think this would be continuous or discrete height can be 5.6 5.86 inches 5.7.5 right so on and so forth you can represent height in decimal format the moment you can represent height or any variable any data in decimal format that becomes continuous data what about weight of a person if you try to measure weight of a person would do you think that would be continuous or do you think that would be discrete this will also be continuous because weight can be 109 kg or 109.29 kg 109.2932 kg so on and so forth you can go to any decimal level possible so if you can represent something in decimal format that means that is continuous data and as i have told you i have this habit of you know using some witty examples no offense is meant okay against any gender i need to make the statement because otherwise people will like hey this guy is gender biased okay. i'm sure a lot of you all watching this video listening to this lecture are married if i ask you a question on how many times does your wife beat you <laughs> so would that be continuous data or discrete data i'm sure a lot of married folks would give me right answer your wife might beat you once or twice but does she beat you only 0.23 times no you cannot represent that in decimal format right so if you cannot represent that in decimal format then that data would be called as what data discrete data Right. i'm sure this happens i'm i'm, I'm sure married folks would agree with me okay so while this is the key that you need to understand let me go to the mind map once again so when it comes to data types we have continuous data and discrete data within discrete data you have categorical data as well as count data within categorical data we have binary data and multiple data 
Well, let's spend some time and try to understand a few more things here. Okay. Categorical binary. Uni means one. Bi means two. Tri means three, so on and so forth. Usually anything greater than three would be called as multiple. And two is called as binary. These are the terms which we shall be using. And remember the golden rule. While some discussion is happening, I request you all to take a book. Keep writing whatever is being discussed. Only if you do that, you will be able to understand maximum concepts. And even if you are able to understand, 40% of what is being discussed, you have achieved a good deal. If you watch the video once again, from 40%, you would certainly reach 60%. That means 60% of the topics discussed would be clear. If you watch the video once again, you would certainly reach 80%. So 80% of the concepts, topics would be clear. And that is what we need to clear the interview, friends. That is all that you need to strive towards. Never aim for 100%. As I've told you, we are not robot movie Rajni Khan. Right? There's a movie right called Rajni Khan, uh, called Robot. So there, the robot is going to quickly scan the books and it will remember everything. So we are not that. So let's accept the facts that we are humans. We need some time to internalize the concepts. Okay. So that's um, one thing. Maintain the running notes. Never aim for perfection at one go. Okay. And uh, if you do not understand a specific topic or a specific concept which is being discussed, don't keep thinking about that. That's okay. Past is past. You cannot do anything with your past. The second that you have lost is lost. Gone is gone. Let bygones be bygones. Just focus on the present. Don't focus on future. Don't focus on past. Focus on present. Whatever is being discussed. And that's the best learning strategy. Be in the present. Okay. Later on, you can think about future or past. After the you know, learning is done, you can focus on all of those aspects. Okay. Another very important thing is read this mind map daily at least once. Whether you are understanding the concepts, whether you are understanding the terminologies or not, is immaterial. You need to just focus upon Understanding the terminology, okay, or probably just getting yourself familiarized with the terminologies. Let me put it that way. Because you might be hearing for the first time these terms such as, you know, categorical, count, binary, multiple, etc. Maybe you're listening for the first time, a few of you all at least. So when you open this and continuously keep reading these terms, you'll at least get familiarized with the lingo, with the language that is used in data science. That's probably the stepping stone towards your success. That's probably, this is probably the first step. Get familiarized with the terms. You need not know what that exactly means, but get familiarized. And don't focus on only those things which are being discussed. There are a lot of additional things in the mind map which we probably might not be able to cover in uh, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, or 30 minutes, right? So I request you to read the entire mind map daily once. It would probably take you 10 to 15 minutes worth spending. These are a few, you know, you, you might feel that these are all very mundane activities, but let me tell you, these are extremely imperative extremely important for you all to become successful data scientists. Okay, let's proceed further now. So, we have 
binary categorical data and multiple categorical data. Will an employee a treat or not? A treat means resign. Will an employee a treat or not a treat? Will a customer churn or not churn? Customer churning means customer will start looking out for uh, another competitor. Person who has taken an insurance policy, would that person claim insurance or not? So on and so forth. Does a specific person have cancer or not? All these are examples of binary. Is a credit card transaction going to be fraud or not? Is a particular credit card transaction going to be fraudulent or not? All these are examples of buy, to, a treat, not a treat. Churn, not churn. Claim, does not churn, right? So these are all binary too. So uh, these kind of data types would be called as binary categorical data. You might have multiple categories as well. For example, would a person repay the loan on time. If you're supposed to pay the loan amount back in three years, probably you repay in three years. Or maybe you might pay ahead of time. You might say that, hey, I don't want to wait for three years. Within two years, I'll repay the loan. Or maybe you might delay a few installments. So instead of three years, you might take four years. So you delay the payment. Or you might be a willful defaulter. Remember, if you do not pay for three consecutive installments, you would be called as a defaulter. So here we have multiple categories. If you get down at an airport, usually in a lot of countries, developed countries, you have a lot of modes of transportation from airport to the city. Usually airports are at the outskirts. Right? So you might want to travel via train or via bus or via cab. Within cab, you might have carpool, right? So on and so forth. Or probably you want the entire car for yourself. So we have multiple categories here. We have more than two categories. If you have more than two categories, then it is called as multiple categorical data. And on the other side, we have count data. Count means, for example, a number of cars which cross a traffic signal in the morning from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. Count number of cars. Number of customers who defaulted on the loan uh, probably from 2010 until 2020. Number of passengers who try, uh, who, who cross or who pass by the security check from maybe 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Number of flights which take off. Number of customers who visit a shopping mall. Number of footfalls. All these are examples of count data. So on one side, we have continuous data. On another side, you have discrete data. Within discrete, we have categorical data and count data. Within categorical, we have binary data and we have multiple data. Within multiple, we have nominal data and ordinal data. And within continuous, we have interval data and ratio data. Oh my God, this list is not ending, right? But trust me, this is the last part. When you expand this, you'll just have certain examples, right? So now let us understand more about nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio data. But even before we proceed further, 
I wish to explain you all about a small, um, you know, real world travel experience of mine. While I was in um, US, I traveled to Russia and New York, right? John F. Kennedy, JFK Airport. From there, I traveled to Russia. And uh, while I traveled there, when I went into the you know, airport, they gave me the boarding pass on which flight number was written, gate number was written, and the pilot told that the outside temperature was five degrees Celsius. And in Dumodedovo airport, when I got down in Moscow, pilot told that the outside temperature is 10 degrees Celsius. Then I was reading a magazine, which was $4. One of my friend was reading another magazine, which was worth $8. And this is the kind of discussion which happened. My friend who was seated beside me told me that, you know what, outside temperature in Moscow is twice as what it was in New York. I don't know. He was a little agitated, my friend. He was telling me, come on, Barani, can you not do a basic calculation? 5 multiplied by 2 is 10. And you're saying no. What kind of a data scientist are you? And then I explained him the entire story on why it is not so. Then he started uh, thinking through that and he told, oh yeah, now I agree. And when I told him that, hey, the magazine, I mean, he told me that, do you know what? Wall uh, the Harvard Business Review magazine the cost of that is twice as what Economist magazine would cost you. I told yes. Because 4 multiplied by 2 is 8. Why on earth did I say no when it came to temperature? Why on earth did I say yes when it came to price? Let's understand more. Okay. And on the boarding pass that they have given to us, the flight number was written. Flight number is just a number. If I give you all the flight numbers, what information would you glean from that? What additional insights would you get from that? If I give you details of all the flight numbers, all you can say is these many number of flights flew on that specific day. If I give you names of all the people who are attending the training for watching the video, at max you can say that these many customers or these many people are watching the session. Beyond that, you cannot glean any meaningful information. Or you might argue with me saying that, hey, if I know who are the various people and if I know the names of various people, I can figure out how many of them are male and how many of them are female. But trust me, if you would not have seen me in a video and if you would not have heard my voice and if someone would have told that the tutor who is going to train you, that person's name is Barani. You would certainly, you know, probably you might be guessing on whether this person is a male or a female. So that's name of a star, by the way. You have stars and then Barani is name of a star. So it's star is gender neutral. Okay. Anyways, so flight number using which you cannot glean any meaningful information is called as nominal data. I didn't explain this travel experience, you know, just to make you guys feel that, hey, this guy has traveled to a lot of countries. No. The point that I'm trying to drive is the data types. And on the boarding pass, gate number also was written. But the good part here is gate numbers 
can be arranged in a sequence. You can say gate number one, two, three, four, five in that way. So there will be an order, a sequence. So there will be an order or sequence to the data. When you have order within the data, it is called as ordinal data. That is a only addition or only additional information you can glean from this ordinal data. So that is also not extremely meaningful anyways. Then we have temperature data. Now I gave this example to my friend. When my friend told that, you know what, 10 degrees Celsius is twice of five degrees Celsius, I told no. And he was a little agitated. I explained him and then he was fine. So I'm sure a few of you all might be like, hey, what is this guy talking about, right? But I'll try to demystify that in probably next one minute, 33 seconds. Is it isn't why I give you exact number. Anyways, so I told to this person that get two people, person A and person B. Get one person from Antarctica. Okay. And get another person from Saudi Arabia. And then expose both of these people to 10 degrees Celsius. The person who is from Antarctica would have survived throughout his life in sub-zero temperatures, minus degree Celsius. If you expose that person to 10 degrees Celsius, that person might say, wow, it's quite warm out here. It's warm is what this person might say. And if you expose this person from Saudi Arabia to the same 10 degrees Celsius, this person who probably got used to 50 degrees Celsius might now say that, hey, it's very cold out here. Same temperature value, same number, two different people have different perceptions. This kind of data, which is subjective in nature, it depends on the person who is experiencing this value. If it is subjective in nature, then this data is called as interval data. And this kind of data would also not have an absolute zero. There won't be any absolute zero. Hey, what do you mean by absolute zero? Oh my God, these statements are bouncing over my head. Hold on. Hold on to your horses until I complete the entire discussion. I'll explain. I'll get back to this. Now, when price was being discussed, I told to my friend that, and he was, he also asked me, hey, why are you agreeing here that $8 is twice of $4? Then I told that, okay, if you give $8 to Mr. Antarctica or Mr. Saudi Arabia, it doesn't matter. Whatever Mr. Antarctica can buy for $8, Mr. Saudi Arabia also can purchase for $8. So there is objectivity. So those values which have objectivity within that would be called as ratio data. And you know what? For this kind of data, you are going to have absolute zero. What do I mean by that? If I say I have zero dollars, that means I don't have any money with me. But when I say zero degrees Celsius, does that mean there is no temperature? No, that means the temperature is very cold out there. That is what zero degree Celsius means. But zero dollars does not mean that. Zero dollars means that you don't have any money. It is subjective. So let me erase this part. And then just write down here 
two key things. Point number one is that when you have interval data, it is subjective in nature. And there would not be any absolute zero. However, when it comes to ratio data, it is objective in nature and you are going to have absolute zero. Why on earth are we expected to, you know, learn about these measures? Because these are scales of measurements. And when it comes to mathematical operations, nominal data is the least preferred. The only thing that you can do is count. If you know all the flight numbers, you can just count how many flights exist or how many planes exist. Rather. If I give you names of all the people who, who are attending the session, all you can say is, these many people are attending. The only thing that you'll come to know is count because nominal data is nothing but names or labels, names of companies, names of people, names of vehicles, names of buildings, names of places, names. It in its own doesn't give you any meaningful information. Some kind of proportion, what proportion of people are male, what proportion of people are female, right? More is that value which repeats maximum. I mean, we'll get into all these things later, but then this is all that you can calculate. If you have ordinal data, which is the next best preferred, nominal is the least preferred data, do not collect that. But because if you collect that, you cannot glean any meaningful information. That means you're wasting your effort. You're wasting the time that you spent in collecting the data because you cannot analyze much. Then you have ordinal data. If you have ordinal data, you can rank the sequence in which the data is available. You can arrange the data in sequence. When you have this, some statistical analysis, yes, you can perform. The next preferred data happens to be interval data. And the moment you have interval data, you can do additions, subtractions of the values that you have. And you can perform most of the statistical analysis. All of these things, all of these descriptive statistics, we will get to that. I have a habit of just briefly introducing you all to the terms. And later on, I'll get into the depth. Okay, so do not worry and do not press the panic button yet. And ratio data is the most preferred because you can perform all the statistical analysis possible on the planet. The more analysis you perform on the data, more interesting insights you get. The more interesting insights you get, better decisions your management can take. Okay, so the most preferred data to the least preferred. All these are interview questions. What kind of data would you collect, right? Would you prefer ratio data or would you prefer going and collecting nominal data? You should say, yeah, I would any day prefer ratio data because I can perform a lot of analysis. Now let's get into this mind map. So we have interval data, which is subjective. A lot of examples are given, IQ level. When I say your IQ level is zero, does not mean you don't have a brain, right? It means that your IQ level is low. So you have a lot of examples, you can go through that. Ratio data, objective, and it's the most preferred. You have examples pertaining to that. Then you have nominal data and the examples pertaining to that. Ordinal data, you have examples pertaining to that, okay? So you can go through the mind map to get a few more examples. Of course, we also have an ebook and uh, we are trying to launch it in a big way uh, during our 
annual need. And in this also, we intend to give a lot of examples. Okay, so you just, I mean, we, we are revamping it, friends. We are revamping. Actually, we have uh, 300 odd pages. Okay, but we have given away for free only 168 because, um, you know, yes, this is a freemium model. Right? We don't want to give everything. Anyways, so let's get back to this. So this marks the end of data types and scales of measurements. However, we are expected to learn a few additional things about the data types before we jump into data collection. Okay, so let's get into the next topic and let's understand the other data types.